Yeah, both of them. Clear the way for you. We need to keep those bastards at bay while the tea is being dumped. Let me help. I'm yours to command. The Boston Tea Party. This was one of the key events leading up to the American Revolution. Protesters, some dressed in full native garb, boarded three ships docked in Boston Harbor and threw their cargoes of tea overboard to protect, protest British taxes. Throwing tea into a harbor probably broke a world record for making the biggest cup of tea ever, though if there is one statement guaranteed to rile a Britain, it is an unnecessary waste of perfectly good tea. So, simple enough, but the lead up is a bit more complex. The East India, India Company actually wanted to sell the tea to all the colonies at a cut rate to boost its flagging profits. However, taxes on the tea would have to be paid to the British and the, the instant the tea was unloaded in Boston Harbor and the colonists had a long-standing problem with paying taxes to Britain when they had no representatives in British Parliament. Offering discount tea while still collecting the tax on it was viewed by the colonists as a trick to get them to agree to Parliament's authority over them. Protesters turned black ships, black ships carrying tea to New York and Philadelphia, and if that had happened in Boston, the problem would have been solved. Unfortunately, the governor of Boston wouldn't let the tea ships leave once they were in the harbor. I guess he figured the public would come around eventually and just pay the tax because everyone likes a bargain. But that never happened. In fact, protests got bigger and bigger until a meeting at the old South Meeting Hall. The mob broke, out, broke away from the crowd there and dumped the tea, solving the impasse and wasting the tea. I shuddered as I wrote that. The British reacted to the protest by sending British troops under Thomas Gage to occupy the town. They also closed the Boston Harbor, part of several laws they created to punish the colonists that were dubbed the Coercive Acts. Of course, these laws didn't gain them any sympathy with the colonists and led fairly directly to the outbreak of the revolution. Tea is important business. Put in the water before musket air assassination.
Wow, he flew down. Dumped the tea. Okay. Good, good. Dump the tea. Dump no tea. Pick up the weapon. Don't multi. Two of them in the water. No, idiot. Pick up the weapon and up, open the thing. Climb the thing. Climb the climb the thing and kill it. Yeah. We've done it. There he is, kill him! Gunner! We saved the last one for you. Hmm, hmm, hmm. We get out of here. Huh? I want to kill him. Punch naval axe. Newspaper unlocked. Robinson tea chest. The Boston Tea Party. Yeah, I read that one. I'm gonna do a liberation contact first. Angry citizens. <clears throat> Efan, how is your ale? 
peace, but it gets the job done. My father would be disgusted, but after a day's work with you, a man needs to unwind. I would prefer a nice bottle of wine, but these colonies lack refinement. <laughs> Your father? Mon père. He was a great man. A cook in the French army during the Seven Years' War. He marched all across the White North, feeding Louis-Joseph de Montcalm and his officers, cooking them feasts from sticks and berries. When the commander-in-chief opted for open conflict over manning the battlements of Quebec, every man was called to arms, including my father. He died on the field. But I'm told he fought ferociously. It matters little. He's gone now. Mm -hmm. He would be proud of you. This is my one hope, that he smiles upon the choices I've made. Okay, so what are we doing? Okay. Almanac. Actually, no. We are going back to main missions. What's up, man? It is done. Johnson is dead? No. No. He retreated when we destroyed the tea. Only to hatch some new scheme, I'm sure. We have to get rid you of him. You should have killed him. You should have. There was no need. Time will tell if you speak the truth. Six months. Radun Hagedum! Radun Hagedum! Ganondokon, why are you here? Has something happened? William Johnson has returned with all the money required to buy our land. He meets with the elders as we speak. I have begged him to resist, but I fear he shall have his way unless you intervene. How is this possible? We destroyed the tea. The Templars are nothing if not resourceful. You should have heeded my warning. Uh -huh. Please, you have to stop him. Of course. Can you tell me where they're meeting? In the frontier, of course. Before I do that... Let's talk to Peglek guy. Got some more? Let's have a look then. More keepers? Good on ya! I'd say that's worth another letter. I will be back for the rest. New destination. Okay. Homestead. I'm sorry. Yeah, ma. You're just worth a lot of money. Oh. 
quality of hunting spoil depends on the hunting technique. Less damaging weapon give better results. Hi. Izzy not gonna dar dit ganusate ne Johnson si unja dar rocks ta. Gua he can see what neganun hara dun hagedum. Ta gua der hara gua kanto. Let's have a twist with zooming out, yeah. Coercive acts. The coercive acts, sometimes called the intolerable acts, were a series of laws passed by British Parliament in response to the Boston Tea Party. Among other things, these laws replaced the elected Massachusetts legislature with an appointed one and closed Boston Harbor until the East India Company was reimbursed for the tea, which, let's be honest, was never going to happen. <laughs> the acts were a major blow against Massachusetts' economy and self government. The acts got their name because British Parliament hoped that the crackdown would coerce the citizenry into behaving like good little colonists and stop the violent protests. That's the same thing happened to them. Unfortunately, the acts had the opposite effect. It made it easier for Whigs to argue for independence and difficult for the loyalists to argue that Parliament had their best interests at heart. Seems nobody likes a bully. The Boston Massacre was the culmination of several fights between British soldiers and the people of Boston. A group of British soldiers fired into a crowd at point blank range, killing five. The reality of it is less damning to the British than it sounds, but started as an argument about a wig maker's bill, of all things, turned into a mob. Hundreds of Boston citizens kept eight British regulars cornered for hours. By the end of it, many were holding clubs, throwing stones, and taunting the soldiers to fire. Captain Thomas Preston was in charge. Thomas Preston, Esquire? was in charge of the regulars and tried to defuse the situation by talking with the crowd. They asked if his soldiers' guns were loaded, he admitted that they were, but it would have been stupid for him to order them to fire since at the time he was standing in front of them. It wasn't until one of the soldiers was hit by a stone, which forced him to drop his musket, that the regulars fired into the crowd, against the orders of Preston, who later testified he never gave the command to fire. It's possible his men mistook the taunts of the crowd for an order. The regulars were arrested and tried for murder, Six were acquitted, including Thomas Preston. The other two men were found guilty of manslaughter, but had their thumbs branded in lieu of the usual sentence, which was death. One of the interesting things about the massacre is what happened afterward, that is, how both sides tried to spin it to their advantage. The fact that most pop people call it a massacre should give you some idea of who won this particular PR war. The revolutionaries portrayed it as an attack on colonial liberties, and images of the events popularized by Paul Revere showed an organized British force firing into the crowd, not a confused group of soldiers cornered by an angry mob. The British, on the other hand, referred to the event, the incident of King Street, were naturally calm in a crisis, unlike countries who insist on turning every minor confrontation into a three-ring circus. Anyway, the wig maker dropped his prices and it never happened again. I call it a victory for the bold. Okay. Yeah, there's no fast traveling in this. Yeah, that won't hit. Come get me. Ah, oh, undetected. Okay.
Don't swim to it, climb it. Focus. There's a feather. This looks climbable. Boot, deadly, doesn't pay much attention to surroundings, will have a sniff out and attack in human tools on the site. Be on your guard, use bait or poison darts. Uh, yeah, it's worth a lot of money. Is this climbable? Come on, do not fall off. No, come on. Come on. Let's go! Yama. Knock on hammer or something. Okay, looking good, making progress. Ooh, feather. Climb, climb.
Nope, 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 nope. From here, back here, over there. And I'm really not sure. From here to there. Where's the other guy? That's a long fall. Hang on. I can't tell us any two of them. Bloody. Shit, shit, shit. Peace, peace. Have I not always been an advocate? Have I not always sought to protect you from harm? If you wish to protect us, then give us arms, muskets and horses that we might defend ourselves. War is not the answer. Me remember, Stanwix. 
We remember you moved the borders. Even today, your men dig up the land, showing no regard for those who live upon it. Your words are honeyed, but false. We are not here to negotiate, nor to sell. We are here to tell you and yours to leave these lands. So be it. I offered you an olive branch, and you knocked it from my hand. He has every point. Perhaps you'll respond better to the sword. Are you threatening us? Yes. Yeah, apparently he is. Treaty of Fort Stanley. Signed, 1768. This treaty was meant to resolve ongoing land disputes between the indigenous peoples and ever encroaching colonists. King George III had established a boundary line in 1763, but it had no basis in reality. Colonists were already living west of the line when it was drawn. Not to mention the land wasn't really the king's to divvy up. I'm sure that just slipped his mind. Kings can be notoriously forgetful. The poor darlings, when it comes to the rights of others. Members of the Iroquois Confederacy met with William Johnson at, the forts, at Fort Stanwix to negotiate a new boundary line on behalf of themselves and other smaller nations like the Shawnee. They used the term negotiate rather lightly. In reality, the Iroquois didn't have much choice in signing the agreement that was give away some of their land and achieve peace or fight a long and drawn out war. The question was only how much. When the treaty was signed, it was generous to Johnson, to say the least, even handing over lands the British had left to the Cherokee earlier the same year. In fact, the Stanwix Treaty was so controversial that the British-run Board of Trade ordered Johnson to renegotiate. He refused. Johnson made a fortune speculating on land. Imagine this treaty was quite a windfall for him. Yeah. Brannock Expedition. Which Johnson infected, limit native casualties, assassinate Johnson. Let's move then. Ah. Oh no. What have you done? Ensured an end to your schemes. You sought to claim these lands for the Templars. Aye, but we might protect them. Do you think that good King George lies awake at night, hoping that no harm comes to his native subjects? Are that the people of the city care one whit about them? Oh, sure. The colonists are happy to trade when they need food or shelter or a bit of extra padding for their armies. But when the walls of the city constrict, when there's crops that need soil, when there's... When there's no more enemy to fight, we'll see how kind the people are then. The colonists have no quarrel with the Iroquois. Not yet, but they will. This is the way of the world. In time, they'll turn. I... I could have stopped it. I could have saved you all. You speak of salvation, but you were killing them. Aye, because they would not listen. And so, it seems, neither will you. Nope. I was neyate hagum sir, am dahya yum neskana zizagum haje. That's a lot longer than the request, Captain Pache. Damn you! God damn it, parry it! Parry! <laughs> he headbutted me and I went sprawling. Fine, let's go. To, I need to leave first. Oh, 
hostile negotiations. Wait, what did I fail? Almost one dive to escape. But I did! Uh. This game is so buggy. William Johnson is dead, and with him, the Templar plot to steal the land of my people. But in ending this threat, I have revealed another. On his body was a letter addressed to John Pitcairn, containing orders to root out and destroy Patriot weapons and supplies. Should he succeed in this, the colonists will be unable to maintain their resistance, mm -hmm. and the Templars will surely take control. Mm -hmm. So long as Pitcairn lives, the danger remains. I need to find him. He needs to die. I thought it might bring clarity or instill a sense of accomplishment, but all I feel is regret. Hold fast to that. Such sacrifices must never come lightly. I had to do it. Not only for my people, but for all the others Johnson would have harmed. It's a start. But to truly be free of Templar influence, all of them must be dealt with in turn. Even your father... I know. You speak the words, but do you believe them? Seems we've company. For closure? What is it? A request for aid from Paul Revere. Seems the Redcoats are up to something in Boston. Guess you made an impression on the Sons of Liberty. They mistake me for one of their own. Please tell Mr. Revere he has my sympathies, but I cannot help at present. You might wish to reconsider. John Pitcairn is mentioned by name. Where am I to go? Mr. Revere's house in Boston. If you'd like, I can... I know the way. So I'll figure it out. New recipe smoke bombs. Hip mines. Poison dots. Paul Revere House. Paul Revere lived in this house with his family from 1770 until about 1800, with some notable exceptions, such as when he had to lie low because he'd warned the countryside of the British march on Lexington and Concord. But with the shortage of firewood in 1776 and the loyalist insistence on getting back at anyone who'd defied them in the past, you'd think this wooden house might have been torn down too. But it wasn't. This might be because Revere left his eldest son, also named Paul, in town to watch over the estate. In any event, the building is still around today. One of Revere's descendants bought it in 1905 and turned it into a museum. Now the oldest building in Boston. In fact, it was already 90 years old when Revere bought it. Colonial architecture is apparently superior to that of your average McMansion. No shirt. The Devonport Homestead. This lovely little collection of buildings was the headquarters for the original Assassin Order of the Colonies, a modest Masyaf, if you will. Sometime during the Seven Years' War, the Templar made their moves and destroyed it during their Assassin Witch Hunt, by which I mean there was a witch hunt for assassins, not that there were assassin witches. Healy survived the attack and stuck around to keep the man standing, barely, by the looks of it, once Connor came along and flourished again for several decades, even surpassing its former glory. Then it suddenly vanished early in the 19th century. Any manner that can suddenly vanish is both interesting and unsettling in the same measure, though probably not a great investment. Oh. 
Ah, Connor. What a relief. You came. <laughs> Allow me to... <laughs> to introduce you to William Dawes and Robert Newman. Your letter said John Pitcairn was here. Aye. He's readying an assault on Lexington, where Adams and Hancock have taken shelter. After that, he will march on Concord, hoping to destroy our weapons and supplies. You must help us. Only tell me where to find him, and I will put a stop to this. He has dozens, if not hundreds, of soldiers at his command. You cannot hope to match him by yourself. You don't know me. But fear not, for you will not have to. We have an entire army of our own, merely awaiting the order to take up arms. Then you must call upon them. Indeed. You and I will cross the Charles River and rouse the boys. William, I need you to take the overland route and do the same. Robert, I need you up in Christchurch. Light the signal. Two lanterns, our enemy comes by sea. No time for dawdling, my friend. <laughs> we have lives to save. Come on. Stop touching me. William Dawes Jr. April 18th, 1775. Ah. They've only left a single horse. We'll have to ride together. Ah! You take the reins, I'll navigate. Quickly, Connor, get on the horse! You want to lose your boat? You're annoying. I'll guide you towards those we need to alert. Follow my directions, and we'll be done in no time. Yes, this is exactly where we need to be. Robert Newman. A Saxon of Christ Church, known today as Old Norse Church, and a personal friend of Paul Revere's. It was Newman who hung the lanterns from church steeple to warn riders in Charlestown that the British were marching on Lexington and Concord. Two lanterns indicating the British were traveling by sea. And because it's a pet peeve of mine, you may have heard that Newman put up the lanterns to warn Revere about the British approach. It's one of those historical details everyone seems to get wrong. We already knew about the raid, in fact had been the one to pass knowledge on to Newman. The lanterns were meant as a warning to lookouts in Charleston. A backup in case Ovia was caught before he managed to leave town. Please learn this so I, you can impress girls on first dates as I do, though they often seem so overwhelmed by it they rarely call again. That's the power of knowledge, and it's dangerous. Newman had some difficulty with his clandestine plan, though his family home was serving as a boarding house and several British officers were staying there. Newman managed to elude them by saying he was tired, going to bed, and escaping out the side window. Like something out of a cartoon. His friend, John Pauling, helped him get the lanterns to the top of the tower, while a third man guarded the church door. Newman was later questioned about his actions that night, possibly because a 20-something announcing he's going to bed early is inherently suspicious, but he talked his way out of it, out of arrest, and fled Boston. When Newman returned to the city, he went back to his old job as church sexton. There's evidence he took money to show tourists around the church crypt, including displaying the body of John Pitcairn, which might have something to do with Newman being replaced by a new sexton in 1788. William Dawes Jr. Boston Revolutionary and one of the riders sent out to war Lexington and Concord that the British regulars were on their way the night of April 18, 1775. The other rider was of course Paul Revere. While Revere took the route across the water to Charleston, Dawes took the longer route across Boston Neck. He arrived in Lexington shortly after Revere did. Dawes was a tanner by trade. These days he would make a fortune in New Jersey, the amount of tanning that goes on there. And while he wasn't as politically active as Revere, he did wear a homespun suit to his wedding. Now, I know it doesn't sound intensely radical, but at the time it was quite a statement. At the time, the rebels were trying to enforce boycotts of British products like cloth, encouraging people to buy American. By advertising his suit was locally made, Dawes was putting himself firmly on the Patriot side of the equation. He might as well have worn a bowler hat and mask with the king's face on it, though that would have been weird at a wedding. Excellent! We are right on course! I don't want to sell goods for convoys. 
I believe we are on course. Okay. No open conflict. Redcoats. What are they doing here? They must be scouts. Be careful, Connor. We mustn't let them warn the others. Tell me I'm going the right way. Left! Left? You pointed right. Let's continue the search on foot. Are you sure? Fine. That's a cat. Where's the feather? What? Nothing happened. I'll guide you towards those we need to alert. Follow my directions and we'll be done in no time. To the right, Connor! To the right! I believe we are on course. Redcoats. What are they doing here? They must be scouts. Be careful, Connor. We mustn't let them warn the others. Turn right! Here we are. Best to continue on foot. That's what I meant. This is what I meant. Oh, there it is. Yay.
Okay. What? What now? Did we talk to people? What? This is it! You have got the right place! Okay. Let everyone know that the regulars march for Lexington and Concord. The British are coming! Back in the saddle, my friend. We have more people to warn. Keep going! Turn right! This way, Connor! You're yelling too much. I'm right next to you. Keep going! If you just... This way, Connor! Give it double horns. Yes, this is exactly where we need to be. Whoops. Did you hear that? Could be red coats. Careful. That could be is. Go right, Connor. Hmm. This way, Connor. Um, red coats. And the river. Hmm. This is not right. Oh, really? Excellent. We are right on course. The horse is broken. Wouldn't surprise me if we ran into more trouble. Stay alert. Is there another way across the river? Answer, no. None of this looks familiar. Shut up, get off the horse. Get back on the horse, Connor. The horse isn't walking. What are you doing? I'm trying to get to the place. Be on the lookout for red coats. Get back on the horse. Connor? Yeah. Tell me something. Uh, Connor? What? What? Did you hear that? Could be red coats. Careful. We will never finish in time if we go by foot. Okay, then tell me where to go. Isn't this the place? Uh, Connor? What?
This is it. You have got the right place. Be on the lookout for red coats. We will never finish in time if we go. Are you insane? Nice texture. Spread the word. The regulars are coming out. At once! I'm just gonna go inside and finish my dinner. This way, Connor! Yes! This is it! This is the way! Regulars are guarding the bridges. I can't, there's a river. Let us continue the search on foot. This one, right? This is it! You have got the right place! The regulars are coming. Here! We're here! Get them! Oh boy. Faster! We need to get away from them! Um, are you okay? We need to lose them! Okay, get on the fucking horse. Oh. Make sure none of them get away! It was much too close for comfort. Let us take care to avoid any further surprises. Go, go, Get back go. on the horse, Connor. Go, you idiot thing. Connor. I missed the time. Give me a second. We've gotta shake those red coats. We need to lose them. Walking on it. We need to get away from them. Tell me where we're going. That was much too close for comfort. Let us take care to avoid any further surprises. Yes, this is exactly where we need to be. Keep going. Left. Yes, this is it. This is the way. 
Here we are. Best to continue on foot. This is it. You have got the right place. <sighs> Where the devil is he? Are you sure we are in the right place? Oh, sure, I'm sure. Oh. Uh... Prescott? Evening, gents. Listen, the regulars are out. You need to rally your men. And, uh, put on some trousers. <laughs> At once. <laughs> you look familiar. Be right back. Turkey. Then why the hell was I going the opposite way? Welcome to Lexington, Connor. Now let's find Hancock and Adams. Hmm. No sign of Dawes. I hope he's all right. Paul, Connor. Good to see you. You need to leave. The Redcoats are coming. Aye, so Williams told us. Let them conduct their little search. They'll find nothing. You don't understand. Pitcairn intends to kill you. I'm afraid it's true. I suppose we have no choice then but to go. What of you three? Dawes and I will continue on to Concord. Connor, it's best you stay here and help our man John Parker hold the town. It'll give us time to spread the word. Mm hmm. John Hancock. John Hancock was a Whig leader in Boston prior to the Revolutionary War and went on to be the president of the Second Continental Congress, which was responsible for creating the Declaration of Independence. All very impressive, but most impressive of all was that his name would live on to be a slang for a signature. Now that's a legacy. One day I imagine Sean will be used by children to describe a world with a sneer. I can but dream. Hancock was born in Massachusetts, the son of a reverend, but his father died when he was young and John was sent to live with his uncle in Beacon Hill. Thomas Hancock ran a prosperous shipping business which John inherited when his uncle died in 1764. Hancock was a noted businessman and probably made at least some of his money smuggling, which he was tried for in 1768, though he was never convicted. He joined the Patriot cause after the Stamp Acts, Stamp Acts were imposed in 1764 and went on to become one of the instigators of the Tea Party. In fact, after the revolution began, he was such a well-known rebel that when the Boston governor offered clemency to anyone who would lay down their arms, Hancock was specifically left out of the deal. Hancock's probably best known for signing the Declaration of Independence. His signature was the first on the document, possibly because of that, and possibly because Hancock was known for being extravagant. His name is signed with a flourish, written larger than any of the others. So now in America, your signature is sometimes referred to as your John Hancock. I didn't explain why to some people. That sounds a little bit dirty, but I will. It sounds like a penis reference. Who is Samuel Prescott? When Paul Revere and William Dawes left Lexington on their way to Concord, they were joined by Samuel Prescott, a young doctor from Concord. Prescott was a member of the Sons of Liberty, a natural choice for an anti-British nighttime ride. Prescott was in Lexington that night to visit his fiancée. I assume that's who we saw run off. He was intending to return home late. A happy coincidence for Revere and Dawes. Prescott knew the area well, so when the three men were stopped by British troops, it was Prescott who managed to elude his pursuers and reach Concord to sound the alarm. 
It's the same thing. After that night, well, Prescott sort of disappears. I have a record that he may have died as a British prisoner in Halifax in 1777, but it's far from clear cut. I suppose he could have left Boston with the British on evacuation day, but how he was captured and when, I have no idea. And these, those are four words I never thought I'd say. French Arabia. Dirk. Four of yours ride. I'm incognito. Four of yours ride. Whoa, this place is packed. Okay, since I have some open world time, and this place is huge, I'm gonna stop for today on the main missions. I'm gonna take my dog out before I pass out from exhaustion, and maybe do some more open world stuff later or offline. Okay, so this was fun. See you later, thanks for watching, stay good, have fun.